you know, women's studies program. So she was in on the very beginnings of women's studies at Wisconsin. After her postdoctoral experience, she went to Mary Baldwin College in Virginia where she became a member of the biology faculty and also was hired to uh, begin a women's studies program there. After a few years, she moved on to the University of South Carolina where she joined the medical school in, as a member of uh, preventive, let's see, how does that go? Family and preventive medicine, right. She's now there as a full professor and is also director of the women's studies program at the uh, University of South Carolina. Sue has uh, numerous collaborations and uh, consultant work. She's consulted with approximately 50 different universities and colleges and foundations in the area of issues of women in science and curriculum. She's the author of numerous journal articles and a uh, couple or several books including titles such as Female Friendly Science and Feminism and Biology. Tonight she will talk to us and hopefully give us some hints about how to make science friendlier for females and everyone in general. Thank you. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Eugenia. I'm very pleased to be here at Iowa State. Uh, it was good to renew some acquaintances with folks I knew and to get to meet some other people here. And I'm excited about what you're doing uh, for women in science and see great hopes for the future. As I'm sure most of you are aware, the demographic projections for the workforce in the year 2000 are quite different for uh, than the workforce we have today. Specifically, the suggestion is that between 85 and 90 percent of workforce growth will be constituted by women and by men of color. Uh, to be very specific, there will be 23 percent more blacks, 70 percent more Asians and American Indians, Alaska Natives, Pacific Islanders, 74 percent more Hispanics, and 25 percent more women. As you know, these are not the groups that by and large have made up the scientific, engineering, and professional uh, associations and careers in large numbers. So that when we look at the changing demographics of the American population, we need to think about where we will get our scientists and engineers for the future. One of the things that's becoming clearer is that not only are we not attracting men of color and women to science, mathematics, and engineering, as a matter of fact, some studies suggest that we're not even attracting very many white men anymore. Uh, a recent study suggested that 42% of all students who enter college stating that they intend to major in science, mathematics, or engineering, drop out after the first introductory course and change to the humanities and social sciences. Another 23% approximately change before graduation. So the suggestion is that we are losing students even uh, at the introductory levels in college. Those of us who are at the university often like to say that there are problems in the pipeline in K through 12, and that is certainly true. But um, I have to say that Science Magazine quoted me as saying, women are leaking all along the way, which is not quite what I said, but <laughs> women, women are <laughs> leaking all along the way. But one of the places that women are leaking is both on the undergraduate level and then at the graduate level. So that I'd like to concentrate a little bit tonight on what we might do to change that. Now, when we talk about the fact that the attrition of women is relatively dramatic compared to that of men, uh, one of the significant issues that arises is that the women who drop out of science, math and engineering, tend to have as good or better grades than the men who stay in. So that although some of the individuals dropping out clearly do not have the ability, that is not by and large the problem with women. So that the suggestion is that this is a potential source of scientists that we are turning off. These are individuals who have the ability. 
I'd like to go through a little bit of the pipeline data just to indicate the general loss and then the loss of women relative to men. An Office of Technology Assessment report looked at 4,000 students at the ninth grade level, 2,000 males and 2,000 females. Of that original cohort, only 1,000 of each group have sufficient mathematics by the time they're in ninth grade to stay in the pipeline. So clearly one of the things we need to do at the K through 12 level is to encourage students to stay in mathematics, to keep their options open. When the two groups are followed to the end of high school, 280 men and 220 women have sufficient mathematics to pursue a technical career. A major drop, though, occurs in women upon entrance to college and decision to major. And 140 men and 44 women choose scientific careers. So this is a major issue, usually, that occurs in the first year of college. Now, we have some information about this from the Illinois Valdictory Study. In the state of Illinois, they had approximately equal percentages of men and women uh, who were valedictorians, and about equal numbers of each who stated that they were interested in careers in science and mathematics when they entered college. But after the first course in science or mathematics, many more of the women students than the men students had changed to humanities or social sciences. Uh, again, the situation was that their grades were as good or better than the men who were persisting in science and mathematics. They asked these students why they were switching, and of course there was a variety of answers, but one of the things they mentioned was that they saw a career in science as incompatible with having a relationship and or family, and that was something that most of these women wanted. I think, in fact, it's something that most men want, too. Uh, and so one of the things we really need to address uh, with our students is uh, providing them with different role models of women who do have relationships of different types, who do have families, who don't have families, so that they can see there's not just one type of individual who becomes a scientist. After a career choice is made, actually a larger percentage of women than men complete their intended degree. At the bachelor's level, 46 men and 20 women receive degrees in science, mathematics, or engineering. The data also show that women enter graduate school relatively in the same proportions as the degrees they've received in science, as do men. But then again, that first year in graduate school seems to be another crucial segment in the pipeline, where there's another major drop. People are not sure exactly what occurs here, but there's some combination of attrition and stopping with the master's degree that causes a further significant drop in the pipeline. So that by the end of the schooling process of that original cohort of 4,000 students, 2,000 males, 2,000 females, five men and one woman will receive a PhD in the sciences, mathematics, or engineering. So this is what we mean when we say that there is attrition all along the way and that the attrition of women is significantly greater than that of men. What I would like to present tonight are sort of 20 practical techniques um, that I have evolved over the years that may be useful in retaining women students and some students of color uh, in science and mathematics. As Eugenia indicated in her introduction, my background is in zoology. So many of the examples I give are from zoology, although some are from other areas. I'm really interested to hear from those of you in other fields uh, what you have found to be particularly useful in the classroom, because I think this is an issue that we need to address nationally, and there's a lot of concern about this right now. I've divided these ideas along the stages of the scientific method. So first I'll talk about observations, then methods and approaches, theories, conclusions drawn from the data, and finally the practice of science. First under observations, uh, an idea I have is to expand the kinds of observations beyond those traditionally carried out in scientific research. 
What I'm suggesting here is that if we are going to attract more diversity to the pool of scientists, we need to recognize it and value it when we see it occurring in our classrooms. I'm really not so interested in attracting more people, um, more women, more men of color to science and engineering simply to have warm bodies, although sometimes I think that's what NSF and those folks are interested in. I am really interested in attracting more diversity to the pool of scientists because I think it will provide for a better science. When you have people from different perspectives looking at data, they may see things that have not been previously noticed. What I'm thinking of here is what happened when we began to have large numbers of female primatologists going out into the field. Uh, they began to look at female-female interactions in lower primates. Before that time, male primatologists had been in the field, and there was nothing that prevented them from observing such interactions. They just didn't do it. They tended to look at male-male interactions, male-female interactions, occasionally maternal-infant interactions. It was as if their perspective on the world as men, which had allowed them to relate to other men and to women, was somehow transferred to their notion of observation in other species. Again, I'm not saying there was any reason they couldn't observe female-female interaction. They just didn't. And what happened when these female primatologists went out and began to observe female-female interaction was that this resulted in more than just adding additional data that supported the theories that currently existed. It turned out with this more complete picture of reality from the female-female interactions, when that was added to the other data that was already there, it um, seemed that some of the theories and conclusions were inappropriate or incomplete with regard to dominance hierarchies and subordination, that actually the animals behaved in somewhat different patterns. This is often the case with information from women's studies. When you begin to focus on a new group and uncover new information, it not only adds quantitatively more data, it causes a qualitative shift in the theories and conclusions that have to be drawn from previously existing data. So that in the classroom, what I'm suggesting is that if a student uh, who comes from a little different background than that traditionally uh, found in the classroom suggests a an answer that at first seems to be wrong. <laughs> uh, sure, probably 99% of the time it is wrong, but every once in a while that student may actually be seeing something that is fascinating, that is new, that is interesting, that his or her unusual perspective, because she comes from a different um, background and has a different set of experiences, or because he comes from a different culture, may in fact be precisely um, a new idea that science needs to know about. So that if we're going to encourage diversity uh, in the pool of scientists, we have to be able to recognize it and accept it when it occurs in our classroom. Second idea I have is to increase the numbers of observations and remain longer in the observational stage of the scientific method. Uh, data from the National Assessment of Educational Progress indicate that females at ages 9, 13, and 17 have significantly less science experiences than boys of comparable ages. What I'm talking about here is disparity in use of scientific equipment, things like compasses, thermometers, telescopes, scales, work with experimental materials such as magnets, electricity, plants. Now clearly a lot of this is due to sex role stereotyping and the sorts of toys that we give our children and the kinds of extracurricular activities that are encouraged. But the result is that when we get these students in college, oftentimes the women's students, sometimes um, students from inner city backgrounds, have less hands-on experience with the equipment, uh, particularly the equipment used in the physical sciences and engineering. I think there are a couple of implications directly for the laboratory. First thing is I think it's very important uh, wherever possible to pair females and females as laboratory partners. If you pair males and females, all too typically what happens is this ends up with the male working with the equipment and the female taking the data. 
This is great for her clerical skills, but does nothing for her when she gets into her next science class. And again, I emphasize this is not so much an issue in biology as it is in engineering and uh, physics and the heavily intense equipment areas. Uh, a second thing that I'm a little bit worried about, I do some work with engineering schools like Carnegie Mellon and Rensselaer and, and some places like that. And a huge trend in engineering schools, of course, is the use of computer simulations since equipment is now extremely expensive and goes out of date quite quickly. Again, I worry about this particularly for the female students or some of the male students who have not had a hands-on experience with that piece of equipment which they can fall back on. I think it's okay to have computer simulations as long as you have a piece of equipment there in the room and ask the students to be sure to spend some time hands-on with that piece of equipment. Uh, from industry, we're also hearing back that sometimes computer simulations do not cut it. Uh, that for students, when um, the equipment blows up on the computer screen, it doesn't quite have the same impact <laughs> as when it's broken or blown up uh, in their faces. And so there's some movement back uh, from exclusive use of computer simulations. And I think that's something that we really need to think about when we introduce these new technologies. Are there certain groups who are particularly disadvantaged by the introduction of this technology? Another idea is to incorporate and validate personal experiences that females and women are likely to have had as part of the class discussion or the laboratory exercise. I'm sure it's no secret to anyone in this room that almost all learners, regardless of their learning style, are much more interested in something with which they've had personal experience. Um, for example, when I taught introductory biology, I always found that students were much more interested in human reproduction and the parts on <laughs> human anatomy than they were the structure of the cell or plant taxonomy. Um, there is some suggestion that the very large percentage of women that uh, are now majoring in the life sciences in biology now, it's almost oh, it's about 48 or 49 percent of the bachelor's degrees that are going to women. Uh, and a strong percentage of the PhDs, close to 30 percent. Whereas in contrast, only 13 percent of the physical science degrees on the undergraduate level are going to women. And there's a lot of variation in some areas, like it's as low as 2 or 3 percent uh, in some areas of engineering and other um, parts of the physical sciences. One suggestion is that some of the factors that may be attracting women to life sciences instead of the physical sciences is familiarity with uh, the materials and the equipment and the terms that are used in the life sciences. I think that it's important um, when we start to discuss a concept in particular that we make certain that we use terminology which is likely to be familiar to all students. Many students will be put off um, from understanding the concept simply because they do not know what a trajectory or a transformer is or if football terminology is used to uh, explain certain concepts or if the discussion of vectors begins and ends with the use of sailboats, for examples, and you have students who have never seen a sailboat, let alone sail them, you know, they really may not be able to get past that to understand the concept of vector. So I think this is something uh, that we really need to be aware of in terms of the background and experiences of our students. Something else I think that comes into play here is that two students sitting in the same class may perceive certain terminology and information differently because of factors regarding self-esteem and other things going on in their lives. For example, in mathematics, we often use terms like, it is clear, it is simple, it is obvious that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we know uh, from the data of Alexander Aston that the self-esteem of women goes down each year they're in college, whereas the self-esteem of men goes up each year they're in college. 
So if you take two students, one male, one female, sitting in that classroom, who here, it is clear, it is simple, it is elegant, it is obvious that even though um, for the female student, she may think, this is not clear, simple, elegant, and obvious, I must be dumb, I'm going to drop out. Whereas the male student, who may have slightly higher self-confidence because of other uh, issues, may say, this is not clear, simple, elegant, and obvious to me. You know, could you give another explanation? So that I think it's very important for us as faculty to realize that two students hearing exactly the same words may um, interact or, or take those words quite differently depending on other issues going on in their lives. Another idea I have is to undertake fewer experiments that are likely to have applications of direct benefit to the military and propose more experiments to explore problems of social concern. Uh, a reason that I suggest this is that if you look at the gender gap differential of voting, the biggest gender gap differential um, is women voting for butter issues over guns. Also, research has shown consistently, and I used to actually ask women students who clearly had the capability of majoring in science why they were majoring in something else, and of course I got all kinds of different answers. But one thing a good number of them said was that they associated science with the military, and they did not want to have anything to do with that. So that, again, to the extent that problems focus on bomb projectiles or trajectories and things like that, that can be an active um, you know, and negative turnoff for many of the students. Also, um, in terms of problems of social concern, study after study indicates that women, and to a certain extent for um, men from certain ethnic groups, uh, such as African Americans, uh, perhaps Hispanic, certainly Native American cultures where uh, social concern, returning something to the community are emphasized, that if you can demonstrate that the social value of science or the practical application, that this will be a positive incentive. For example, Jan Harding in England took what was essentially an engineering problem and she embedded it in different contexts. She set, found that for the women students, if the context was something like this will help an elderly person with a prosthesis or something else of social value, the women students worked very hard and solved the problem just as quickly as men students. For men students, the context did not seem to be particularly important. Uh, the technological fix itself was sufficient. So if you think about the way we teach many of our courses, particularly our introductory courses in science, a lot of them are taught in what I would call context-stripped fashion. And there's some suggestion that that may be a reason why they are less appealing to many women students. I think it's all, they're also less appealing to a whole group of men students for whom context is, in fact, quite important. Uh, there is now some movement afoot, not necessarily coming just from women's studies, but from other areas in science, to uh, begin to put science more in context, because that does seem to be more appealing to students. Also, if you look at those scales of development, uh, for example, the Perry scale, the average 18-year-old female is higher up on that scale of development than the average 18-year-old male. What that means is that she is more able to deal with ambiguity, with shades of gray, with uh, questions that are more holistic, whereas he um, is still very interested in dealing with questions that have concrete solutions, yes, no answers, black and white sorts of situations. Again, if you think of the way that we present um, much of our scientific data, especially in those introductory courses, it tends to be towards that style more of the 18-year-old male than the female. I think to uh, retain a lot of the women students and some of the men who are uh, more interested in the connections and the holistic picture, often if you can demonstrate how that piece of data fits into the broader picture, that will be sufficient to hold them in. 
Uh, when you're looking around for problems, uh, to substitute for these bombs and footballs and <laughs> other projectiles. Um, I would suggest that you consider looking at problems that have not traditionally thought to be worthy of scientific investigation because of the field with which the problem is traditionally associated. Um, for example, Marcia Matches draws the analogy uh, with males and cooking to try to point out why it's important that students be somewhat familiar uh, with the terminology so that they can actually think about the concept rather than by being put off because they don't know what the term is. She says, envision the thoughts and feelings of an adolescent boy asked to enter the kitchen, recipes and definition list in hand, and to prepare a full meal on which he will consequently be graded. Realize that he is in competition with female peers, though they have also never done this particular task, have considerably greater facility with the equipment required. Perhaps by this analogy, we can understand the apprehension of the adolescent girl deciding whether or not to take high school physics. And if you're looking for other areas uh, from which you might get problems, um, one area I would suggest uh, comes from the work of Ellen Swallow Richards. Do you know who she was? Who was she? Yeah, founder of home economics, right? Right, she was a chemist, that's right. Um, a lot of times the work of women scientists has been reclassified as what's sometimes now called non-science simply because they were uh, women and they used interdisciplinary methods. Ellen Swallow Richards worked at MIT. She was a chemist. Uh, much of her work in terms of the water tables are still used by the state of Massachusetts. Some of her tests for volatile gases and food purity are still used by OSHA. But MIT didn't know what to do with her. Her male students often went ahead to become heads of chemistry departments. Some of them are recognized as the founders of ecology. But they didn't know what to do with her, so they made a separate school for her, which was a school of home economics. Uh, so sometimes when you're looking around for other uh, problems and ideas, I, I would suggest that you look in those areas. Another idea is to uh, where appropriate, particularly in biology, formulate hypotheses that focus on gender as a crucial part of the question asked. Sometimes laboratory exercises in introductory classes include gender as a hidden assumption or hidden aspect of the question. Sometimes a male norm is simply assumed. I feel I don't need to say quite as much about this anymore now that NIH has been called to task so heavily for you know, using the male body as a norm for testing drugs which are then applied uh, and uh, the data is extrapolated inappropriately to the entire population of both males and females. But I found, for example, for years that I was teaching a laboratory exercise in introductory biology that assumed a male norm. This was the exercise on the Siamese fighting fish, beta splendens. In that exercise, we asked the students to observe the reaction of the male beta splendens to another male, to self, they held up a mirror, and to a female beta splendens. End of exercise. Now, it was a long time before I figured out what was wrong with that exercise. Uh, and eventually I realized, okay, the female is being used as an object. But as is often the case when gender is this kind of hidden assumption, it's also not very good science. If you really want to look at animal behavior, you need to take a look at the reaction also of the female beta splendens to another female, to self, and to the male. So that I think in some cases this um, embedding of the male norm is a problem in various exercises and we need to be thinking about gender, be thinking about race when appropriate and see whether or not that has not been hidden in some of the science that has been done. A final idea under the observation stage is to undertake the investigation of problems of more holistic global scope rather than the more reduced and limited scale problems traditionally considered. Modern biology, which emphasizes cell and molecular biology, tends to be very reductionistic. 
I think this gets exacerbated a good bit in our laboratory periods where we have a relatively short period of time and we feel a big compulsion to complete a laboratory exercise in that period of time. Many of our students lack the extensive background in science or the familiarity with the organism studied, the knowledge gained from uh, similar experiments in other organisms to understand the context and the ramification of the particular experiment that's being carried out during that laboratory section. They tend to see the experiment as a singular example of a minute phenomenon that occurs in an obscure organism. For example, counting the assay in Neurospora seems to them to be a weird activity that we scientists enjoy for its own sake. They see very little connection between this experiment, genetics in other organisms, and chromosome mapping in humans, or the Human Genome Initiative. And very often, we as faculty fail to make those connections for them. Again, it's my uh, opinion that particularly for certain students in the class, many of the female students, uh, perhaps males from some ethnic and cultural backgrounds where context and relationship are emphasized, this may be more problematic than for other students for whom the context is not an important part of the learning. So the extent to which we can show uh, and you know, talk to the students about how this particular experiment fits into a broader context may be enough to permit those students uh, to see the more holistic picture which they are interested in. Now I'd like to turn and talk a little bit about methods. Perhaps um, a way to connect a little bit more to the holistic picture is to use a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods and data gathering. As I've suggested, some females have um, said that their lack of interest in science comes in part from their perception that the quantitative methods of science don't permit them uh, to study the questions in which they're interested in, which are much larger and holistic questions. Now, it's certainly true that science doesn't answer everything and can't answer everything, but science is a great deal more creative and can deal with a good many more questions than I believe most of us give the impression, particularly in our introductory courses, which tend to be taught in a somewhat cut and dried fashion. Um, I think sometimes if we can uh, provide some quantitative measurements, which maybe they're doing in the laboratory, and put that with some qualitative information to answer a rather interesting question, this may be more attractive to those students. For example, quantitative physiological data such as blood pressure, pulse rate, glucose and protein quantities from urinalysis and weight can be combined with qualitative assessments given by the patient herself such as fatigue and nausea during pregnancy uh, in order to determine the progress of the pregnancy. That is a topic in which many young women are very interested. And if they can see how some of these measurements they're learning in the chemistry lab or the biology lab could be combined with more qualitative data, um, that would be something that's interesting to them. Connected with that is the notion of using methods from a variety of fields or interdisciplinary approaches to problem solving. Because of their interest in relationships and interdependence, female students may be more attracted to science when they can see its application and use in other areas. Mills College, which as you probably know is a small liberal arts college for women in Oakland, California, explicitly made use of this by having their students enroll in a social science course either simultaneously or the semester after um, the math course that they had been taking where they would use the methods from the mathematics course in the social science course. Also, they would have the students do internships where possible, where they would apply the mathematics that they had used to a social, practical problem. In their dual degree engineering program, instead of having that set up the way it is at many institutions where the students do engineering over here and they do their <laughs> liberal arts degree over here and never the twain shall meet, uh, there was an explicit application, for example, at the level of the senior thesis where they would apply the skills and techniques they had learned in engineering to solve a problem in their liberal arts uh, program for the thesis. 
Uh, third idea under methods, <coughs> excuse me, again, I feel I really don't need to mention as much anymore, but the importance of including females as experimental subjects and experimental designs where appropriate. You know, nobody is suggesting that females have to be included in studies of prostate cancer or that males have to be included in studies of cervical cancer, but that it is extremely important to include both males and females, perhaps because of the cyclicity, rather than, for those of you who are not biologists, you may not know the history behind this, but female rats and primates, including humans, were typically excluded from clinical trials of drugs and other um, experiments with chemicals because of the cyclicity from the estrus or menstrual cycle, which um, messed up the uh, <laughs> results from the drug that was being injected or whatever was being tested uh, to a pharmaceutical company, time is money, so they wanted clean baseline data. So the male was chosen because of his non-cyclicity. Now when you got to humans, there was a whole other set of complications in that most drug testing was done on prison populations and then also pharmaceutical companies feared testing a drug in a woman of childbearing age. Um, you know, being afraid that she might give birth to a deformed fetus. So there were some, you know, sort of solid reasons for doing this, but the result was that virtually all the drugs that were tested were tested on males only, and yet, as we know, when they go on the market, they are taken or prescribed more frequently to females than males, and there's some evidence also that women buy more over-the-counter drugs, although it's never clear whether they're buying for their entire family or whether they're actually taking those. So <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Anyway, and we do now know that the menstrual cycle, in fact, probably does affect metabolism of drugs in various ways, and this is information that we need to know. So um, we now have gotten NIH to follow its protocols and include females as experimental subjects when appropriate. Uh, another methodology idea is to use more interactive methods, thereby shortening the distance between the observer and the object being studied. Uh, many, stu many female students in particular find it important to establish a relationship between themselves and the object they're studying. There's some work in psychology by people like Nancy Chodoro and Myra Dinnerstein uh, suggesting that this has to do with object relations theory and the fact that most of the primary caretakers in our society are female and so that women or little girls are encouraged to be less uh, independent, less autonomous, less separate, whereas little boys are encouraged uh, to be more of those things. Evelyn Fox Keller then uh, took this work in object relations and applied that uh, to science and the characteristics of science scientists and suggested that this was perhaps why more men were attracted to science since distance, separation, and objectivity are emphasized. Whatever the case may be, it does seem to be true that on the average, women are rather more interested in establishing a relationship with um, the object they're studying. For example, my students are fascinated to learn that Barbara McClintock could predict what her corn kernels would look like before she pulled back the husk. Uh, I don't know, I have a little trouble myself with the whole June Goodfield, you know, being a tumor. I, I don't find that too attractive. I never wanted to be a tumor, but um, Jan Harding summed up the situation very well. She said, when school science is presented as objectified and abstracted laws, that enables those whose personalities fit this approach to the world of enabling control and protecting them from emotional demand to feel comfortable. By and large, such individuals are males. Changing that presentation of science is likely to attract individuals of different personality types, namely more women. Uh, a final idea under methods is, and I'm almost reluctant to mention this, I am not uh, an anti-vivisectionist or totally against using animals in research. But I do question um, in the laboratory exercises, in the introductory courses, uh, the use of particularly harsh treatment to animals or something that can be perceived that way. What I'm really thinking of here is the pith a frog <laughs> exercise in introductory biology when the students are asked to pith the frog. I think it's okay if the instructor piths the frog. But when the students are asked to pith the frog, um, I've had a number of people tell me uh, that that was really a turnoff to them uh, in science. 
and that that was when they dropped out of science. And it seems that significantly more females are bothered by that than males, although I'm not sure if it's not just that women are permitted to express such short, sorts of feelings um, more easily in our society perhaps than men are. Um, a problem with that lab is that except for when I took intro biology or taught intro biology, I really have never pithed a frog. And most biologists do not sit around pithing frogs all day. <laughs> but it does leave a lot of students with the impression that if you're going to become a biologist, you know, uh, at least one fifteenth of your time or whatever it is, it will be spent pithing frogs. And this is a, a big deterrent. Uh, for many students. When you ask faculty what the function of the actual pithing of the frog is, rather than using a frog that's been pithed by someone else, and you know, if the student does it, it really is, does border on harsh treatment, because very few of the students can really hit the brain the first time. Typically, you know, it's going through the eye or someplace else. And so I think that, I'm sorry, <laughs> clearly the description is even upsetting <laughs> to some folks. Um, I really question the use of that exercise. When you talk to faculty about why it is there, a lot of them say, well, it's really kind of an initiation, right? Uh, you know, to separate <laughs> the men from the boys, right? You wonder where the women. So I, I really do question that in intro biology. Obviously, at some point, you do have to get into animal research, and I have done a good bit of that myself. So I'm not against animal research in general, but I do wonder about that in the intro courses. Now I'd like to turn to theories and conclusions drawn from data gathered. First point is to use precise gender neutral language in describing data and presenting theories. I'm sure that most of you are aware of some of the studies that have been done surrounding language in groups of small children in which they take uh, two groups of small children, tell one of them a story using theoretically um, generic and inclusive language like he, mankind, men. And then they ask those kids to draw what they've heard and they draw pictures of the story that include men and boys. And they tell the other group of children the same story, only they use truly inclusive language like human beings, men and women, boys and girls, he, she, and ask those children to draw what they've heard. And their pictures include both boys and girls and men and women. Well, although on the college level I don't know that the pronoun issue uh, is so important, although I do think it makes a difference if students are constantly hearing the scientist heed, that that is a negative message for women students sitting in the class and that should be avoided. I think something else that really becomes important is um, use of the classic way we refer to scientific experiments. Uh, tends to make the students envision two males, even when one of the experimenters was a female. For example, if we refer to the Hershey-Chase experiment in the classic scientific way, which is the Hershey-Chase experiment, most researchers, not most researchers, most students will envision two males because the stereotype is very strong in our society that, two sci that scientists are male. You may ask, how strong is that stereotype? It's extremely strong. You may be aware of the Draw Scientist Test, which was first done in 1983 by Chambers and has been repeated uh, with different age groups and very recently and in different environments. And essentially what happened with the same results virtually, uh, they asked 7,000 kids to draw a picture of a scientist. About 6,921 of them drew a male scientist. <laughs> Only about 79 of them drew a female scientist. No little boy drew a picture of a female scientist. Almost all little girls, of course, drew pictures of male scientists. So the stereotype is extremely strong that scientists are male. You might be happy to know that we have other characteristics which are not too charming. They depicted us all with bad complexions. I'm not sure what that was about. Strange looking clothes, funny hair. There's not in general a very positive <laughs> image of a scientist out there in our culture. And I think you know, you're all aware of some of the movies like nerd movies and My Science Project and so on that have contributed to this. But certainly one of the images that's out there is that scientists are male. So that this is very... Um, very powerful for women students who are thinking of become, becoming scientists to think about role models. One way to overcome that is that in the cases where 
experimenters are female. You can just mention the first names of experimenters. For example, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase when you're looking at the experiments of uh, DNA and bacteriophage. You, know, you don't even have to give a half hour lecture on the history of science. When you say Martha Chase, you know, in less than a second, you have broken that stereotype. I also ask my students to uh, learn and name the nine women who have won the Nobel Prize in Science and Medicine. So I'll ask you if you can name the nine women who have won the Nobel Prize in Science and Medicine. What do we win if we win? <laughs> well, you'll be one of the only groups I've ever met that can do it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's worth something. Marie Curie. Marie Curie, good. Who else? Rosalind Yellow. Great. Rosalind Yellow, terrific. Irene Curie. Irene, yeah, Joliet Curie, right, her, her daughter, Marie Curie's daughter, which is also a good one because it shows, you know, women can have children and be in science. <laughs> Who else? Barbara McClintock. Barbara McClintock. We have Rosalind Yellow. Maria Geppert Meyer, right, Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin, Gertie Corey, Rita Levi Montalicini, and then who got it most recently? Down in the research triangle area, near where I'm from. Right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Acyclovir and the other antiviral drugs. Here we go. Okay, so, you know, I think it's very important for students to know that there are nine women who have achieved in this traditional way and reached what many people would consider pretty much to be the top of the uh, scientific hierarchy by winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, I think it's also important to encourage uncovering of biases such as those of gender, race, class, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, which often permeate theories and conclusions drawn from experimental observation. Uh, there has been a history of science being misused to uh, fit political or social agendas. Uh, this is a long history that we can easily trace back as far as the 19th century and certainly even before that. But uh, for example, the craniometry research um, that Stephen Jay Gould so nicely documented in his book, The Mismeasure of Man, uh, for those of you not familiar with this, uh, at that time scientists measured brains of white men, brains of men from other races, brains of women, and they always found brains of white men to be